Okay. Here we go. Today we are going to be talking about infographics. It's a deeper dive into infographics and thinking about it in terms of upskilling for our students through assessments. Um, I am Dr. Kim Godwin, uh, an instructional designer with MTSU Online, and with me today are, as always, Karen Hine and Tara Perrin to answer any questions in the chat. Because we are a smaller group today, though, feel free to jump in and interrupt um, however you want or need to make sure that um, your questions get answered. So our outcomes for today are to, uh, oh, I'm, see, technology today is it's winning. Uh, describe the purpose of an infographic mastery and upskilling. Explore the element of critical thinking in infographics. Identify one assignment you can adjust to be an infographic. Recognize infographic as a career tool and feel confident developing a rubric grading info rubric and grading infographics. We're going to try to meet all those today. That's our goal. Okay, so if you went to our earlier one that we did in the fall, we talked a little bit briefly about what an infographic is. So um, feel free to go back and watch that one. It's on our YouTube channel. Um, but I'm going to give us a, a little bit about what it is. And then also in relation to what we're talking about this time and going a little bit deeper. So not quite as much that here's what it is and and these are what they represent, but much more about the role that they play in terms of assessment and upskilling for our students. So what is an infographic? Um, it's a visual representation and there's a, a great little definition for you there. And I will send you all these, this PowerPoint afterwards. Um, so it's a visual representation of information. It's um, how students are able to take something that they have been reading, watching, studying, um, whatever it is that you have them doing in your class and taking that information and putting it together in a visual format. So a, a page document um, that takes everything that they've learned and really made it concise down to a one page thing. So instead of a 15 page paper, it's a one page infographic. Um, it's a way to present complex and dense information in a way that shows that critical thinking, that shows their um, processes for learning, the application and the synthesis of information. So it's not about here is all of this information and then I'm just going to go out there and repeat it back to you. It's about taking all of that and funneling it down so that they are able to really make meaning for themselves and to show someone else what it is that they're trying to um, convey in fewer sentences. Sometimes it's harder for us to take a whole lot of information and bring it down into a few sentences than it is for us to go on and on. Some people are better at that than others. Um, I have a tendency to ramble a little to get to my points. Um, anybody who's ever had a conversation with me knows that. Um, so sometimes making things concise is actually a lot more difficult for me. For other people, it fits right into the way that their brain works and how they need to do things. So it really kind of depends a little bit on the person. Um, so I wanted to ask y'all, and if y'all can just like unmute and then chime in, but what current assessment tools do you use in your classes? Like tests, papers, stuff like that. I, um, hello, I use, uh, let's see, I'll use rubrics. I can, I'll use, um, yeah, just um, quizzes, tests. Yeah, I mean, I run a, a whole bunch of different kinds but I've just never used an infographic before so oh awesome yeah, that was okay. I'm studying a lot of the things that you've been teaching us with h5p into my classes so that's been yay. fun yeah. <laughs> yay that's awesome Tara will be glad to do that her next h5p presentation is on the 14th of March um uh, because we had to reschedule the last one uh what about the rest of you what are y'all using uh, mostly quizzes, um, just short discussion board posts uh, that are collaborative with the class, and then uh, uh, longer writing assignments. 
that have uh, really sh strict rubrics. <laughs> You're in, you teach PRST 3995, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that class used to have an infographic in it, and they took it out with the most recent uh, update, just so you know. Um, okay. Well, that's good to know. I just kind of wanted to know where we were on that because that will help me have more conversations about um, what we can do and why infographics are so beneficial. Um, so the benefits of creating infographs for student learning. So these are just some of the things to kind of think about as we're, we're going through this. So as I mentioned earlier, it's really about critical thinking skills. Uh, it's about students taking information and really processing it. Um, I think this is a trend that has been happening for quite some time, but those of us that have been teaching for any length of time have seen it, that so much of what is happening in high school coming up to college is test focused. Um, and so students are getting here and they don't necessarily have a trained skill set yet on critical thinking and how to do some of those deeper level concepts. And so something like an infographic uh, can be a way that you can really meet your students where they are uh, in terms of that critical thinking. Instead of going from, um, I've written a paragraph in my previous learning experiences to here's your 10 page paper, this kind of can help them start processing that information into a different way of seeing that the concepts and applying the concepts and making those connections. Um, so it can really help with their critical thinking and it gives them practice. So it also allows for some creativity with students. And this really does support um, universal design for learning, which is, you know, when you really embrace the different ways that students learn and process information and providing them different ways of viewing information um, and we can do a whole thing on UDL someday um, but for me when I think about UDL it's about when you're in your class and you have um, written word you have audio or video you have a variety of activities that students are doing in order to learn the content or to view the content um, looking at it the same way from an assessment side is that it gives them a variety of ways of processing their information. Uh, so that really kind of promotes their own learning. It leads to active learning because they really are engaged in how they are, are making their own choice about their learning material. And then it's authentic in nature because it's about them processing their own understanding. Um, so it's creative in that you get to see a bunch of cool stuff because you get to see your students being creative and showing you who they are through that that artwork because it's basically artwork um through that artwork through the colors that they choose or the template that they choose or the wording that they choose or the images they choose you actually learn a lot about them through those but you are also encouraging them to use their different learning and skill sets within the creation of the activity uh, it tends to lead to long-term retention um, so when we um, actively have to think about doing something or we are are applying something more than just, um, you know, like here's a definition and here's what it means. And then we have a test that here's the definition and here's what it means. If we're actually thinking more in depth about what it means and how it applies to the next step, uh, we have a, a better chance of putting it into our long-term memory because we've done something different with it that caused us to make that connection. Um, it's it's sort of why we sometimes, um, with H5Ps, um, with the mention of using H5Ps, uh, if you're having to really think about what a definition is in order to figure out which word is going in your crossword, you're processing that in a different way than if you're matching. Um, on a matching activity like you're really having to think about it so something like an infographic really enhances that long-term retention because students are thinking about what imaging represents what it is they're talking about um, they're thinking about okay this was an entire chapter in a textbook how am I going to get that down to one page so they're really having to think about that information and that's causing them to put it more into long-term memory 
Um, it's the synthesis and application of information. Um, and that kind of goes with that long-term memory and creativity and critical thinking skills too. But it's very specific and that it is more of your higher order thinking. Uh, think the, the up of blooms, not the low. We're not doing recall. We're not doing describe. We're not doing remember. We're taking information and we're actually applying it to our future use and knowledge. Um, it can enhance communication. So it can enhance written communication and that students are having to take that chapter of information and make it concise that they have to bring it down to just a few words or um, images or just little bullet points for things instead of it being pages and pages of information. It can also help them potentially uh, with verbal communication if you have them presenting them as well. So if they are um, sharing their infograph with their classmates and then you're having them describe it through um, an audio clip or a video clip, that also can enhance their verbal because they're having to discuss what they are presenting visually uh, out with their classmates. Um, so there's that. And then the thing that I think is really important with this, and um, this is probably like the key point for our presentation today, because I talk about upskilling in the title. And this is where we acquire a new skill set. Um, and I add in there in the workplace, how often do we actually take tests or write research papers? So some of us do those things um, because we're in academia. But most of our student population are not going to go on to get a doctorate in nuclear physics. Um, we might have a couple, uh, but we're not going to have a lot of those. So what is it that we're doing to enhance what they're learning in the classroom in terms of what they're going to be using when they get out of school? Uh, and I know there are lots of conversations in the state about workforce development and how are we enhancing people as they're going out into the career force. And I'm not really saying we need to get into that conversation. That's a that's a whole nother debate and topic. Uh, but I think it is important to really reflect on the skills that we're helping our students gain while they're in college. And higher education's purpose is, is much much broader than we sometimes remember and then it's not just about our one class but it's about how does our one class impact the student moving into the next class into their degree program into what they're doing after they graduate so when you're thinking about it in terms of in in the workforce when we are out in our jobs and we're not taking tests and we're not writing research papers, but we are doing presentations. We are putting together um, a one page proposal. Uh, we are having to create imagery for um, different things at our jobs. And so if you think for just a second about, I don't know, the last time you were uh, in a grocery store or the last time that you were at a doctor's office or the last time that you were pretty much anywhere and you walk in and there's always that board of information when you first walk in, a whole lot of those things are infographs. A whole lot of those things are, okay, here's this thing we're talking about. Um, I can't even think. Um so I have to go to the vet a lot because I have two Great Danes and a Mastiff in my house. So we spend a lot of time at the vet. There's an infograph when you first walk in the vet's door about the dangers of tick-borne diseases. And it's got dogs and then it's got information about all of them. And it's up there on, on this really pretty, colorful graphic image. So somebody had to create that. Somebody, I'm sure it was somebody at like the heartworm prevention people place, but somebody had to create that. Somebody's job was to create that. And that's not necessarily somebody that is a graphic artist or a graphic designer or a marketing person. It could have been anybody. But how do we know that the student in our class isn't going to go into a field that having that information isn't helpful? Uh, when you're thinking about your own career and the courses you teach, can you think of careers that your students might be going into where they might ever create one of these things? Feel free to share. It's okay if you can't think of one. But just curious. I don't know what everybody teaches. I know what some of you teach, but I don't know what everybody teaches. Um, I have a lot of students who are going into like healthcare management 
And that could be like any kind of administrative position um, where you might be called upon to create something that would condense that kind of information, like uh, an awareness program. And it doesn't even have to be like, um, I used to be a graphic designer. And so uh, even when I, I worked as like a secretary here at MTSU many, many years ago, uh, one of the things that I did would have, I did create infographics that were about, uh, for example, uh, the percentages of our students uh, that graduate and what type of career fields they were going into. So that wasn't necessarily like directly my job, but it was in that uh, I needed to not only be able to communicate that information over the phone or via email, but I also needed to be able to represent that visually. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, that's such a great example of exactly what I mean. You don't, you're not necessarily going to write a big paper about that or take a test, but that's something that you were able to use uh, in your career. Uh, and especially with your students that you said are going into healthcare, those are a lot of the ones that you see, all those, all the ones about why we should eat more broccoli and less sugar and stuff like that. Um, those are all infographics that we see hanging places. Uh, and that really is teaching students that additional skill set. Did anybody else have any examples they wanted to share before we move to the next? Well, my um, primary teaching is in the school psychology program. And so my graduate students, when they get out, have to do a lot of professional development training with teachers and administrators. And they also do, you know, um, workshops or, or, you know, presentations to parents. And so I thought this might be a good activity to, for them to learn how to, you know, to take a concept and present it this way. Absolutely. Yeah, that is great. It's a direct connection of what they're going to need to be doing. All right. So then we've talked about that a little bit and we'll talk some more about it here in a second. But I wanted to kind of bring up the assessing of infographics, um, because I think this is where sometimes we run into some questions and concerns. Um, and how do we go about doing it? So uh, the big question with assessment of well any anything actually the assessment of anything is what is it that you are actually looking at what is it that you are wanting to provide feedback on what is it that's most important as you're developing your um, rubric uh, and things uh, and I added in there like no really what are you actually assessing in your current assessments um and your rubrics, what, when you think about a rubric in your class or you think about an activity you have, what are some of the things that are in that rubric that you are assigning points to? Or as your, if you don't use rubrics, if you are doing grading, what are some of the things that y'all use to assign points to or remove? So if I'm just doing like a uh, like a, a discussion post and it's 10 points or whatever, I just basically put it on a scale, you know, so um, is it um, perfect work, A plus material, 10 out of 10? Is it lower A material, 9, 8, 7, 6, you know, basically on that kind of that scale. And I always kind of, whenever I do set up grading, I always try to keep that kind of stuff in, in mind. If it's a greater project, you know, how does it, how does it work out to be like an, the difference between like an A and then like an A minus to a B to a B plus, that kind of stuff. So yeah, and I noticed too that if it's lower stakes, like a discussion kind of stuff, it's, you know, it's usually, it's usually graded easier too, so. Are there specific things that you look for that help you determine what that scale is? Yeah, like beforehand, I mean, basically I'm using a rubric, you know, I have like, you know, meets all the demands, you know, uh, does the rudimentary things like turns it in, on, or, like the discussion is turned in on time, it meets word count, that kind of stuff. And then also, you know, looking at the exact content of it too. So like, when it starts to get down to like B level work or C level work, you know, it's not turned in on time or it doesn't engage with the course materials, those kinds of things. So, yeah, I mean, I am I am using kind of like the, the a rubric style anyway, even though I'm not directly applying a rubric to it. 
That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to give you all some some specifics of things that we often see in rubrics when people um, or with assessments when people are thinking about what they're grading and Jordan you did a great job of explaining a lot of these so um, so these are some of the things to think about in terms of what it is that we're looking at so word count content punctuation or mechanics uh, the focus of the information that's being submitted uh, visual appeal. So that's going to actually matter if you're doing something like a presentation, um, a video, an infographic, um, that's actually going to have an impact. Um, and with the same, if you're doing something like a podcast, are you thinking about the audio quality? Um, what is their argument? Thinking about the layout, are they citing it correctly in timeliness? So I put these on here um, specifically so that we could kind of have a little bit of a side conversation about where our priority most lands. So, and I'm not saying any one is better than the other. I'm just, so we can have a conversation about it. So when we're thinking about creating um, an infographic for assessment, unless you are actually in a graphic arts program, I'm not sure that the greatest number of points need to come from um, the visual appeal and the layout. Now, are those important? Absolutely, because if it is a, a train wreck and you can't see it because it's all the same color and you can't read the words or the images are blurry uh, or they don't represent the words. Those are actually important in terms of understanding an infograph, but is that the most important? So as you're thinking about how you're going to put together your rubric for an infograph or how you're going to do your assessing, thinking ahead of time as you're creating your infographic about what is it that you want to focus on is what's going to help your students process that down the road. Because these are activities that they're practicing in school before they get out into the real world to create these infographics, it's a safe space for them to try and learn and sometimes even fail at our infographics and the creation uh, because part of what we're doing in this is teaching them how to do those better. That is actually a side component of these activities. Not only are we thinking about your content and your focus and your argument and, and things like that, that you're applying the, the information from the class and you're really analyzing information and you're creating whatever it is that, that you're trying to get in terms of the content, that's the biggest point of what you want them to have in that infograph. You don't want because somebody um, did it all in blue because they like MTSU, just various shades of blue, that that actually makes it really difficult to read it and see it. So because somebody did that, you're not going to give them a D because it's all in blue, but you might dock them a couple points because they didn't really think about, okay, the the visual visual appealing um, the aesthetics of it and whether or not it can be viewed. So you're going to maybe think about taking a couple points off, but not failing a student because they've never done one before or um, they aren't majoring in graphic arts or design um, and they're not necessarily on that path. Um, it's more about giving you an opportunity to discuss it uh, in a in a paper, and I think about this in terms of classes where I am teaching, um, when I'm reading a paper, I, I read for the content, I read for the information, for the arguments, for, you know, what, what are they saying in this information, but I tend to see myself getting distracted um, by if the grammar is all over the place uh, or things like that, and so really making yourself think about in your assessment of an infograph, what is most important? What is it that they're looking at? And what value am I giving to those different layers of information that's in there? So I say that here because I want y'all to be thinking about that as you're creating. We actually have some sample infographic rubrics from D2L that we can share with you and we'll send them out uh, when the LTNITC sends this out after we'll make sure that those are embedded uh, so that y'all can have them. Uh, but there's some samples of where that is. Are we giving more value to whether or not something was turned in on time or are we giving more value to the content and the focus? Now, I'm not saying that timeliness doesn't matter, but 
is timeliness worth 10% or is it worth 50%? Um, and where does that come in and what message are we giving our students in terms of that value? All right, so why this matters to you. Um, I say this, I think every time I talk about infographic, it matters in terms of time. Um, I'm just gonna guess that y'all don't have an overabundance of time for grading, um, that every week you are sometimes at some point during the week being like, oh my gosh, I have to grade again. Um, I suspect at some point that happens to a lot of us. Um, so time, time is one of those things. When you're looking at an infograph, grading an inf infograph can take a couple of minutes. Grading a 10 or 15 page paper takes a little bit more than a couple of minutes. So if you're thinking about time, your own time has some value into a possible reason why you might want to assign an infograph. Um, and not every week, because there is a lot to be said for knowing that people know how to write. Um, everything can't be an infograph. So don't think that because I'm saying this is something that we need to do, that I'm saying get rid of everything else. I'm saying let's see about having some variety of things. So time is super important because it takes less time for you to assess um, uh, an infograph. I don't know if anybody thought about this yet, but it's a little bit harder to use chat GPT and um, AI to create an infograph than it is to write an essay. Um, because chat GPT will give you an essay in about 30 seconds. It cannot give you an infographic. It may give you some of the information you put in the infographic, but you still have to put it together. Uh, and you'll know if somebody is giving you something that was created elsewhere, if three people turn in the same one with the same words. Um, so it becomes really obvious when it's concise like that, because the information is so different and specific. So if you have worries about that, this is actually one of those ways you can kind of avoid that, because they have to use some other kind of tool in order to create their infographic. Um, it allows for formative and summative assessment opportunities. And I throw that in here um, in part because we tend to focus a lot on needing grades for um, midterm or final or final projects. Um, and this can actually be something that you can assign through various ways. So if you're thinking about um, whether or not your students are, are getting the information and making connections, if they're submitting an infographic, um, as a lower stakes, uh, or a high stakes really, but as a lower stakes activity throughout the process, you're able to see them making those connections. Um, or you can use it at the end and it be a, this is what we've covered, put it all together. This is a final activity, but be aware with that, that you need to have put some tools in place to help them feel comfortable about creating this. So we have some model instructions uh, that, that we can share with you if you're looking to put an infograph in your class that kind of helps students know where to go and how to create and look for templates and how to do things like that. Um, so uh, I try really hard at some point during every presentation except for our like five for the fall or spring updates to tie it into some sort of learning theory in some way. This is not actually just Kim says. Um, this actually uh, does deal with social constructivist theory um, and the zone of proximal development. So when, when we are in learning, when we are at a point that we are being pushed beyond um, our basic understanding or our basic recall, we commit it a little bit further. Our learning is deeper if we are pushed to struggle. Um, and I know I mentioned that previously, but it actually really does apply to learning theory. Um, this is how people learn information, is that we need to push them to a point of struggle. If what they're doing isn't making them struggle, they're not as likely to retain it. They're not as likely to apply it. They're not as likely to remember it moving forward. Now, we don't want them to struggle so bad that they give up. Um, so kind of be aware of that. But we do want them to have to kind of work at it a little bit. Um, and within that, what I mean by that is um, if the response to what you're asking is yes or no or right or wrong, um, that also kind of appears that you're valuing the yes or no or, or the answer above the process. Um, there are absolutely concepts and topics and things like that 
that we need to know the yes or no or the right or wrong. Uh, but activities like this allow for students to go beyond that and help them see that as you're going through these courses or as you're going out into the workforce, there's really not as many things that are yes or no or right or wrong. A lot of things in our world function in, a, in various shades of gray and knowing how to take that information and apply that information and right back to the very beginning and critically think about that information. That is where we are helping our students through this activity, not not only with the material they're learning in our class, but gaining those skills that will help them as they're moving out into their next classes, into graduate school, into the workforce. Uh, we're creating those opportunities for them to have a more enhanced learning experience. So let's chat. Um, I actually am going to stop sharing and I'm actually going to stop recording um, so that we can have a conversation amongst us.